Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Brain Awareness Week, and the Bell Museum is excited to join partners from across the University of Minnesota, the Institute of Child Development, the Department of Neuroscience, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, the Department of Psychology, and the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain to celebrate and foster public support for brain science. We especially thank Boston Scientific for their support of brain programs and activities at the Bell. Today, you are in for a treat. I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Anita Randolph, neuroscientist, educator, and community activist. She studies the effects of addiction on brain function, as well as the cognitive development of adolescents. Currently, Dr. Randolph is the Director of Community Engagement and Education for the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, also known as MIDBEAT at the University of Minnesota, where she partners with community organizations to develop and implement early interventions aimed at the brain health of children and adolescents. We'll start today's Facebook Live with a brief presentation by Dr. Randolph, followed by a Q&A. I encourage you to type in your questions in the comments so we can have a lively discussion. All right, take it away, Anita. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Sorry for all of the technical issues. Um, my name is Dr. Anita Randolph. I am very excited to be here speaking with you um, for um, a live event for the Brain Awareness Week. I am live from Ghana, which is why I pre-recorded it to make sure there were no technical issues, but we still had a few this morning, so I'm still glad that the Wi-Fi is working great here and I can just do it live. So. Today, I will be um, just doing a really quick 15, 20 minute overview, chat about my role here at the University of Minnesota. And so today I will be discussing building healthy connections for life and what that means for the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain or MIDB, which is where I am recruited to work, uh, where I serve as the director of the community engagement and education core there. And so we're just gonna hop right in. So one of the topics that the brand awareness, uh, brand awareness um, organizers wanted me to talk about was my pathways to become a neuroscientist and how I was able to leave community engagement in my professional life. And so I start off with this slide um, where you see this linear line or this straight line to neuroscientists, but I want to be very clear that that was not my journey. I was all over the place, had to go forwards, had to go backwards um, because I'm a first generation college student. So I didn't quite know what I wanted to do or even knew what neuroscience was, but I did have a passion when I was young that kind of put me in the realm of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so as a young child, I was really obsessed with this person that you see on the screen. His name is Steve Irwin, but we know him as the crocodile hunter. And so when I was young, I would watch Animal Planet like every single day. I wanted to walk like him, talk like him. I just wanted to be the crocodile hunter so bad. And one day when I was watching, he visited this place called Tiger Island. And I thought, this is perfect. This is how I'm going to put my own skin on being the next crocodile hunter because I am actually scared of reptiles. <laughs> so I didn't quite know how that was going to work out. But when I saw this Tiger Island, I thought, man, I could do this. And it was so fascinating and so unique because I have this massive amusement park with roller coasters and I love roller coasters and everyone is having fun. And then you'll just see tigers just being walked around the amusement park by their handlers. And a lot of the funding that they use to fund their research and provide the care for these tigers actually come from that amusement park. So it's this really fascinating place where you have all of this fun funding, um, tiger research, and all of their clinical care. And so at that time, I thought, okay, I'm going to be a veterinarian, and I'm also going to do the, the dual program where I go to med school and get a PhD at the same time. And so with that, I was recruited to the University of Georgia because they had some exotic cats at that time. They weren't tigers, but I kind of figured some experience is better than none. And so I went there. I um, was in the animal science program and so as you can see tiger king's picture is here because i was reaching out to tiger island tiger king all the other rest of the tiger folks that was in his documentary just trying to get summer internships but nothing ever happened not even tiger island emailed me back and so at that time 
my advisor said, hey, I think you might want to reconsider what your career is going to be once you leave undergrad. And so I promised myself that I would keep an open mind and I would try things. It's really fascinating because, like I said earlier, being a first-generation college student, I didn't quite understand how all the pathways would feed into a science career. And so I took a ton of microbiology and genetics classes um, because I just thought it was really fascinating. And so when I left the University of Georgia, I left with three degrees, a degree in animal science, microbiology, and genetics. And so while I was there also, um, I was really interested in research and I thought, okay, I'm a research scholar. I need to figure out what I want to do. And of course, tissue engineering came up because that's a lot of the techniques that they were using to repopulate endangered species. But of course, again, no spot for Anita. And so I had to keep an open mind. And at that time, the tissue engineering team had a spot for the neuroscience folks. And so at that time, I was really interested in neuroscience because of all of the things that was happening in the background of my life. Um, the young lady that you see here in the black hat, that's my great grandmother. Um, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She lived in the house with us. And so I just wanted to learn more about Alzheimer's and how to support the family. And then um, the picture to the right of it is also my other great grandmother. Um, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, and then my sister who has the crown, she was diagnosed with autism, and then my dad is a Persian Gulf veteran who was suffering from PTSD really severely at that time. And so I kind of figured, why not learn about tissue engineering? And then um, why not just learn about neuroscience? Because I was already doing so much personal research on the brain. And I am so glad that I tried it because I ended up loving it and never looked back, never worked on Tiger, and totally excited about it. And so when I left the University of Georgia, I wanted to um, really hone in on my neuroscience skills. And so that's why I did the prep program at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And then that experience led me to be accepted into the dual PhD program at the University of Texas Medical Branch. And while I was there, I was able to really concentrate on the demographics of folks that I really wanted to help. And at that time, I was really passionate about and still am very passionate about working with veterans. And so most of my research there was working with um, the veteran population. And then I was also really intrigued about how we transition science and research from the bench or from the laboratory and actually applying it to people. And so the work that I did there was very translational and, and working with a uh, patient or human populations. And so from there, I did my postdoctoral fellowship at the Oregon Health and Science University, of course, at the VA, um, in psychiatry. And throughout all of my academic journey, I always kept community engagement at the forefront of everything that I did. And so that's why I was recruited to be the director of the Youth Engaged in Science Initiative there. And so through all of these uh, journeys that I just presented, it was very academic. Um, and I haven't spent a lot of time just talking about a lot of the foundational work and engagement um, work that I did in all of those years. And so I am originally from Atlanta. My grandmother was very entwined into community engagement in the civil rights era. Martin Luther King's church was just down the street from our house. Um, my grandmother marched and many of the marches was even locked up for a period of time. And so just being immersed in that culture and just seeing her with people like the late John Lewis and just learning from watching them and always being out, it just really fueled and ignited that part of my life. So I knew engagement will always be there. And so these are just some pictures of a lot of the work that I did even in Portland while I was working at OHSU, just organizing and helping with the process there after the murder of George Floyd, which led to me starting a nonprofit called Safer Space for Black Lives Matter that provides no cost mental health um, services to BIPOC folks. And then even on the international front, like I said, I'm here in Ghana. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm here is that I do a lot of international uh, mutual aid work in uh, West Africa, in the villages, and also in the hospitals there. So all over the region, I just love traveling all around Africa and doing all types of engagement work here, almost said in abroad, actually abroad right now. I just totally forgot I'm in Ghana, but also back in the United States. And so that's just a little bit about how I became a neuroscientist. And I just love presenting my story because I want people to know that 
it's okay if you just don't have a linear straight line to the end. You will make it there, I promise, because I am living through that. Okay, so that all of these experiences led me to be recruited to the University of Minnesota, where I'm now an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and also the director of the Community Engagement and Education and so we talked, or I showed this title, um, the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, or MIDB, earlier, and I am so excited to talk to everyone that is out there watching about MIDB and to share how awesome this place is. And so the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, or MIDB, is going to open later this year in the fall. And so here's just a picture of our um, location where they just purchased the old Shriners um, complex. And we're in the process of getting it ready for us to open later this fall. And this MIDB, it's going to be run by two folks that you see here on the screen. The individual on the left is Dr. Damon Fair, who's a powerhouse in adolescent research, particularly in autism. And also Dr. Michael George Deep, who is a powerhouse in the clinic side and also um, um, focuses a lot on nutrition in adolescence. And so when we think about MIDB, our mission is to foster healthy brain function of our children across the lifespan. And so when we think about pediatric mental health, we can throw out names of all of these key players. Um, so just the Department of Pediatrics, like the department that I'm in, or pediatric neurology, child and adolescent psychiatry, behavior sciences. Um, and we think about Minnesota in Health Fairview, they have tons of clinics or just different machines that we use for diagnostics, such as MRI machines or, or community engagement, which is why I'm here. But as you can see, many of these departments function very independently, and there's not a lot of crosstalk. And so one of the things that I'm most excited about at MIDB is that for the first time, all of these key players will be under one roof. And so this will take a ton of guessing game out of which appointments do I schedule for my kiddos? Which order do I do them? Who do I talk to? What specialists do I need to see? How do I get there? If they're all scattered all over the place. How do I navigate this healthcare system? But at MIGB, we took the guessing game completely out. All of these key players are gonna be housed under one roof and there's gonna be a lot of interdisciplinary work and crosstalk that's gonna happen among all of these departments to really support pediatric mental health. And so now that we are gonna house all the clinical people, researchers, all the interventionists here in one place, we can actually increase and maximize information flow um, between our discoveries and the community. Because that's one of our biggest goals at MIDB is to make sure that all of the things that we discover and all of the interventions that we are developing here at the Institute reaches, reaches the community as quickly as possible. Also with this new setup, we can increase the mechanic, uh, discovering mechanistic processes and brain disorders. We're gonna have a ton of just normal brain development research which can then also help us to detect um, kiddos whose brain development is off to degree earlier. And when you mix all of this together, our overall goal and one of our greatest missions is to then move towards individualized tailored treatments for all of our kiddos that are gonna be at MIDB. And so one of the really um, big pushes of MIDB is the first 1000 days of life. Many of our researchers, our providers, are really focused on this critical time period. And we know that this is such an important period in the development of our kiddos because um, by age three, that's where we had the vast majority of our brain growth, about 80%. And then also during this critical period, we have about 700 new neural connections forming every second, which is unbelievable for me to even think about. And so, so much of MIDB is going to go into research, it is going to go into clinical care, and there's also going to be these other focuses and other support clinics that's going to be there. And so, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Georgie, who is one of our co-directors, one of his biggest focus areas is how to support healthy brain development by um, having a healthy diet. And we know that when these kiddos are very little, their brain requires so much um, energy and nutrients 
consuming on properly. And so it's important to make sure that they have all the key nutrients to support healthy brain development. And I just listed a few of them here, um, like having iron and choline and different vitamins in their diet. And so another topic that MIDB will have a clinic for that I really wanted to highlight in this short presentation um, was the toxic stress. And so one of the ways that we can support healthy brain development is avoiding toxic stress and developing positive relationships. And we understand that stress is something that's going to just occur naturally in life. And we need it. We need a stress response because it allows us to evade dangers quickly. But when you have stress that happens chronically or happens frequently over a long period of time, it then results in toxic stress. And that can be caused by poverty, exposure to violence, uh, neglect, or maybe a divorce. And so when these kiddos experience toxic stress, it can change the child's brain chemistry, anatomy, and even gene expression. And all of those things can weaken the architecture of the brain while it's developing, and that can actually lead to lifelong problems in learning, in behavior, and physical and mental health. And so at MIDB, we also um, want to stress that there are so many ways to support healthy brain development um, in addition to diet. So making sure your kiddos have a ton of social interaction. I know that it's COVID right now and it's a little difficult, but even with a parent and your kiddo, just making sure you have a lot of social interaction, um, physical activity, providing new experiences for your kids to explore and be curious to stimulate their brain, and also sensory play just these hands-on activities they can do like this little baby here, just touching like a little bit of rice, mixed in with some toys can also stimulate healthy brain development. And so I talked a lot about all of the awesome things that MIDB has to offer by bringing all of these key players on the one roof, including clinical um, individuals, researchers, uh, engagement folks, <laughs> that would be me. And so, I will be directing the community engagement and education for And this is very important for us because we want to make sure that we weave this engagement in the culture of MITD. And so we really want to make sure that we are supporting the community and that we are centering their voice throughout our process of being established. And so with this approach, we are really wanting MIDB to be community-centered, right? So we really want us to be a community-centered institute. And so with that, I wait to be invited. Even when I get invited into those spaces, I understand that that itself is a privilege. And so I just sit and listen. And then I just take notes until it's my turn to talk. And if it doesn't happen, that's totally okay. I just sit and listen. And then my hope is that when it is time, we can then work with the community to build together and to leverage all of the resources that we have at the community and MIDB to make awesome programs um, on the clinic side and on the research side. And so through this approach, um, I am really intentional about listening to all of the gaps and challenges of the community. I'm very curious and wanna know what does engagement, what the Institute looks like for them and how we can center and their voice. And then also, what is the new conversation that the community would like to move forward with the Institute on? And then also accountability is so important. And so as we're learning about the gap challenges and forming all of these programs in collaboration with the community, it's important to have some type of feedback system to ensure that we are making tangible change together as we build MIDP. And so with the accountability process, one of the things that we're currently working on with the Community Engagement and Education Corps is having a community advisory team that will have a voice in so many things. How patients get to MIDB, what the interior of the hospital look like, what is the names of the facilities, and we just want to, really want to make sure that we are really building an inclusive space for all. And so through all of these conversations that I've had um, since I've started at MIDB since October of last year, there have been some reoccurring themes that the community wants that have been driving a lot of our programming that we will kick off at the end of the year. 
And a lot of that is youth engagement. So we're going to have tons of uh, youth engagement services where you'll have educational tours. At the University of Minnesota, we'll have our Brain in a Box program where we'll bring scientists to the classroom for two consecutive weeks to teach about neuroscience to bring all of these really fun interactive neuroscience games. We will come out and talk to affinity groups. We've been talking to the community a lot about clinical services engagement, how does recruitment look for clinical trials, what type of diagnosis resource maps parents need to help navigate new diagnosis of their kiddos, um, community health workers, patient navigators, even on the education side, not just educating our kiddos and our teachers and hosting trainings and workshops, but also making sure that the parents understand all of the nuances that come along with those new diagnosis. And then also really pushing what we do at MIDD4 to make sure that it translates into the policy so that all of these interventions can get to the community faster. And so these are just a few things that we're going to be doing um, with my team at the Community Engagement and Education Corps, along with the Community Advisory Board. And so with that, I know I'm running out of time. And so I will take any questions that anyone has about the Community Engagement Corps, MITB, pathways to becoming a neuroscientist, anything you have. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Anita. I think you can stop sharing your screen now if we want to, so we can, um, so our audience can talk. And I, again, encourage the audience to use um, the comment section um, to put in your questions. Um, in the meantime, while you're while you're thinking about those, I have a few questions that I thought I would love to, to ask you, Anita. I'm wondering, like, as you are out in communities and you're talking to people about the brain and brain development, um, are there common, it is Brain Awareness Week, are there common um, misconceptions or things that you commonly hear that people say about the brain or think they, they know about the brain that aren't, that aren't true, that, that you... Uh, you like to you like to clear up or to help people better understand the brain and how the brain works. Yeah, I think that, that um, a reoccurring thing that comes in is that if I don't provide the exact the key nutrients that you put on this list, <laughs> that maybe I I messed up my kid's healthy brain trajectory, and it's not always true. And so I just want to encourage people um, to not feel so discouraged if they didn't do the exact that, you know, things at the right exact time. And I didn't give this exact vitamin every day. Um, the kids are very resilient and their brain is very plastic at that age. And so even if they are off track just a little bit, there is a way to, to get back on track. But Dr. Georgie is the expert. So <laughs> I will yield all questions to Dr. Georgie. <laughs> That seems fair. That's, that seems fair. I, you know, I, I think one of the most interesting things that like I've learned about the brain and you've talked a lot about how the brain is rapidly changing and developing um, in children, but that like our brains, even adult brains can change as, as, as I understand. And so I'm wondering what are some simple things we can do no matter your age uh, that to help develop and maintain a healthy brain? What are, what are those key, those key nuggets for healthy brains? Yeah, I think they're really similar that you can present it now. A healthy lifestyle, so healthy eating habits, exercise, making sure you get enough rest, which I am very bad at. <laughs> um, I guess maybe those top three, three things would be really great. Healthy diet, exercise, and then getting the proper rest and keeping down strength. Great. Um, we have a question from April um, about uh, um, MIDB and is wondering, is this just for Minneapolis? Which children will be served by MIDB? We are hoping that we can reach out to everyone across the state. We are in the process of um, working out a lot of the logistics of MIDB because we will open it in the fall. It is housed in Annapolis. And so we understand that a lot of the folks that are around that area will probably be um, the ones that will be receiving the services the most because of convenience to location. But we're also trying to make sure that our tentacles are also reaching out into the rural areas as well, even for engagement stuff. We're, we're working with a lot of the rural groups as well. And so engagement will be in the rural communities and we're hoping that folks um, that are not centrally located in the city will, will also use MIDB as well. That's wonderful. Um, Beverly has a question um, and she asks, are there volunteer opportunities for high school students who are interested in a career in child development or brains? I'll add that. Part. I'm going to say yes. And <laughs> there will be a form to sign up. I welcome all volunteers to come yeah. and work with me. 
<laughs> where do you, uh, can you maybe, and we'll put, we'll put a link perhaps, um, but do you have a website or a place where you recommend that people can go and learn information, more information about MIDB and your work? MIDB does have a website. I should have the address memorized, but I think it's like MIDB.edu, MIDB.umn.edu maybe, (laughs) but there is one. We don't have a website for the community engagement and education forum just yet, but that will be coming in the next following months as we um, prepare and just figure out what our programming is going to be, but we're just waiting and doing that in tandem with the community, so that's why there's no website just yet. Got it. Got it. Uh, you got a, you got a shout out from Mira, Nola, Olivia, and Amelia in Portland, Oregon, and they just wanted to let you know that they're in fourth grade and they're they're watching. Do you have do you have any uh, words to share about about brains or anything for for those fourth graders who who are who are watching today? Hi, everybody in Portland. I just feel so excited that they're all chiming in on Facebook. Um, there's so much happening even at OHSU. So I would encourage them to even keep their eyes um, and their ears open for opportunities for engagement. Um, and then all of the brain folks at OHSU, they're still meeting even in COVID remotely via Zoom and they have a ton of programs that's going to be rolling out soon. So stay tuned. So as you're starting to do um, your community engagement work and talking to organizations, I really appreciated how you laid out your process of, of building those, those relationships. And you're doing that in the Twin Cities and, and beyond. Uh, you, are, you are in Ghana right now. I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit more about um, some examples of the partnerships or the things that are in the works that are really inspiring you right now. Um, I think, oh gosh, I don't even know what things to talk about. There was one that automatically popped in my head, but I didn't ask Dr. Fair if I could say it first. <laughs> um, but there is so much community engagement things that are happening. I think if I can just pick one um, from each bucket that I talked about, um, just getting the youth engaged in science up and rolling at the university is going to be really great. I'm actually really excited to learn about all of the hands-on labs that we have at the university. And I'm hoping that folks can start signing up for tours as soon as it's safe for um, for COVID. Um, and then I'm also excited about our clinical service engagement, our community advisory uh, calls that we're putting together has such a huge voice on what this intake look like, what questions do they feel comfortable with, what they uh, leave off, um, how, who greets them, how are they to be greeted, what is the culture like. So I'm excited to build that part with the community. And then one project that we're hoping to do is have these mental health workbooks that are culturally responsive. So they're going to be tailored to different languages and different groups of people. And even having um, these little short videos that we're working on. So we know that um, our city is very diverse, have different populations from all over the world. And sometimes these mental health words do not exist in people's native tongue. And so just having these folk stories next to the, the mental health medical term so that they can be engaged in their appointments is something that I'm super excited to work with and roll out in the next couple of months. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and this is going to shift a, a, like a little bit of a gear. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, like going back to you, sort of the research part of, of your roles and, and the work that you do, um, what's happening in your field and in your particular area of expertise in brain science right now that, that has you really excited or you think has the power to really change um, our, our understanding and, uh, and, and how we, um, we care for, for brain, our brains moving forward? Yeah, so so much of my work is with the veteran population, uh, particularly those who are struggling with addiction. And so I'm really excited to bring a lot of the tools that Dr. Fair has that he used on the adolescent side, which is like monitoring motion in real time to make sure that you're capturing like high quality data. And so all of the analytical tools, I'm hoping that um, by harnessing the things that they've been using on the adolescent side and bringing it to the addiction side, we can then push um, treatments for for those folks as well, and, and and you know who knows maybe they can have individualized treatments as well. So I'm really excited about a lot of the research and the manuscripts I'm writing right now. So excited. How do you keep it all straight in your brain? That's one thing about uh, you and I've had a chance to talk a few times, and I I often marvel at how how you're you are able to do all do all the things at once. I think your your brain works in some spectacular ways. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, maybe we'll, I'm just checking it to see that um, I don't, audience, this is your last chance to ask a question. Um, and if it doesn't pop up, that's, I'm going to ask the last one. Uh, do you have a fun fact you want to leave us with? Like what, what is your, what's in your back pocket about the amazing things about brains that, that you always like to make sure that people know? I actually do not have a fact off the top of my head. I should have one, <laughs> but I don't have Sorry one. to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> well, um, do you have any party words? Maybe what? Maybe we'll we'll end end with um with sort of recapping your advice for the students out there that are watching and that are thinking about like their future. And the possibility, um, maybe they're inspired by you and your story and want to pursue a career um, studying brains or engaging communities re in, in ways related to brain health. Um, what, what advice would, would you give them? I think my biggest advice um, is to just keep going. I had to tell myself to just keep going, just keep going. And that's what I do even right now because I am all over the place in Africa a lot, in the States, in Portland, in Minnesota. And so I just always tell myself to just keep going. It's going to be challenging to have a STEM degree, whether that be your undergrad, professional school, graduate school, it is challenging. But just know that you can make it to the end. Even you first generation students out there like myself, it is possible. It is possible. Even if you did not get a strong foundation in K through 12, like I did, I did not have a strong foundation, but it doesn't matter. Don't count yourself short. Yeah. And I think on that end, uh, on that note, we will we will end. So thank you so much to our audience. <laughs> thank you so much for um, to Dr. Anita Randolph for joining us from all the way across the ocean in Ghana. We, we appreciate you. Thank you to our audience for uh, hanging with us through some of those technical difficulties. Uh, so we are incredibly grateful to um, to all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much.